Welcome. I'm Renee Fry McKibben, Professor of Economics at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the Australian National University and co-director of the COVID-19 and the Macroeconomy Research Program at Karma. We're excited to have you join us for this panel, a webinar by um, Daniel Rees from the Bank for International Settlements, James Molly from the University of Sydney and Hilda Bjornland from the BI Norwegian Business School on the topic of COVID-19 and policy choices. So I would first like to extend my thanks to our panellists who are sharing their expertise with us um, tonight. Um, if I could please ask our panellists to turn their camera and microphone on. Thank you. Our third um, panellist is um, going to be joining us in one moment. She's actually doing another one of these um, Zoom webinars in, in Norway, but she will be here um, anytime. But let me first begin by um, introducing you to uh, Daniel Rees. So Daniel Rees is a senior economist in the Monetary and Economic Department for the Bank of International Settlements. So prior to joining the BIS, he was the head of the macroeconomic modelling section at the Reserve Bank of Australia, where he oversaw the development of the RBA's core macroeconomic model called Martin. His research focuses on applied macroeconomics, with the focus on the consequences of structural change, commodity markets, and the modeling of the Australian economy. James Morley is Professor of Macroeconomics at the University of Sydney and co-director of the Global Perspectives on Economic Policy Initiative for the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. He's a fellow of the International Association for Applied Econometrics and co-editor of the Economic Record. His research is on the empirical analysis of business cycles, stabilization policy and sources of persistent changes in macroeconomic and financial conditions. He is also a co-director of the Model Uncertainty and Macroeconometrics Program in Karma. Hilda uh, Bjornland, who will be join us, joining us shortly, is Provost for Research and Academic Resources and Professor of Economics at the BI Norwegian Business School. She is a member of the Norwegian government appointed expert group assessing the economic consequences of COVID-19. She holds a Master of Science in Econometrics and Mathematical Economics from the London School of Economics and a PhD in Economics from the University of Oslo. She is the Director of the Centre for Applied Macroeconomics and Commodity Prices at the BI Norwegian Business School and is a Scientific Advisor to the Research Department of Norges Bank. She is President of the Society for Nonlinear Dynamics and Econometrics and on the Editorial Board of Studies in Nonlinear Dynamics and Econometrics. She's also a research associate of Karma. So at the end of May, um, Daniel Rees wrote a paper on dealing with COVID-19, understanding the policy choices with his colleagues, Frederick Boise and Purichai Ranga Jankitpal. This was published at the Bank for International Settlements Bulletin. His paper examines the trade-offs between economic activity, a healthy population and individual um, freedoms. So we've invited Daniel to share his work with us and then we'll hear from our panelists each speaker will have about 10 minutes and then we'll open up to the audience for discussion. If you'd like to ask a question, there are two ways to do so. The first way is to ask a question by using the Q&A function on Zoom you'll see in a box with the label Q&A on your device. You can type your question into that box and you can also see questions that others have asked. If there is a question that you like and you are using a computer, you can click the thumbs up symbol to upvote the question and I will pose the most popular questions to the panelists. If you would like to um, ask your question via your microphone on your device, please use the raise your hand function on Zoom where the participants list is. Well, I think that's where it is on yours. Um, and I'll allow you to turn on your microphone so that you can pose the question directly to the panel. If you would like to ask your question on video, raise your hand and also send me a private ch uh, chat message to let me know that you would like me to turn on your video. Before uh, we begin, I'd just like to let you know that we are recording this session and it will be available on the Karma webpage after the event. So as this is a webinar, you can't be seen on the footage unless I ask you um, to turn on your camera. So I'd just like to welcome um, everyone here today. We have a, a very large group uh, from about um, 20 different countries who are joining us. So uh, we're very much looking forward to um, Daniel's presentation on his new paper. So I'll now turn it over to Daniel. Great, thanks a lot, Renee, and thanks to the people at Karma for organizing this event. Let me just start off by sharing my screen. <clears throat> 
they compare the health outcomes under those policies to an alternative where no containment policies are put in place at all. And under moderate social distancing, the mortality rate of the virus is estimated to result in about half a percent of the population fewer dying under moderate social distancing than under no policy response at all. So that's, that's quite a significant health benefit. In order to convert these, these health outcomes into a dollar value, they use a statistical um, measure known as the value of statistical life. So this is a, I won't go into the details of how this is calculated, but this is a standard measure used um, by, by governments in evaluating a range of health and environmental outcomes. The nice thing about US value of statistical life estimates is that they break them down by age as well, which is quite important because um, COVID is a disease that has very different mortality rates for people of different ages. Now in the US, the average value of a statistical life shown by the yellow dot there is about 11 million US dollars. Although, as I mentioned, it varies greatly between people of different ages. So given the Imperial College estimates of the number of lives saved by moderate social distancing and US estimates of the value of statistical life, Greenstone and Nigram calculate that the benefits of moderate social distancing in dollar terms equates to a bit over 30% of US GDP. So that's the, the pink bar on the far left there. So that's a very significant, um, significant benefit um, of these policies. Now, as I mentioned, a number of estimates um, by other researchers have been put together. Greenstone and Nigram is probably at the high end, but by no means the highest estimate that is out there. Now, what we do in our paper is just try to highlight um, some of the sensitivity of these estimates to different assumptions. And the way we do that is by constructing a similar set of estimates for Australia, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. That's what is shown there in the next, uh, next three set of, um, of results in the left-hand panel. Now we choose those three countries because we are able to find quasi-official value of statistical life estimates for those countries. Now what we do is we take Imperial College estimates of the value of lives saved from moderate social distancing for those three countries. We then apply country specific value of statistical life estimates from the quasi official sources and then calculate the value of lives saved um, as a share of GDP for those countries. Now we have to make various assumptions about, um, about the, the distribution of lives saved by age groups and the value of statistical life um, by different age groups. These are all very controversial assumptions, but you know, it's kind of the best that we're able to do. Now you can see in the pink bars there that the estimated monetary value of lives saved as a share of GDP for those other three countries is much lower than the Greenstone and Nigram estimates for the US. Now a small part of that is due to differences in the estimate num estimated number of lives saved um, from these different in these different countries, but by far the largest difference uh, comes through differences in country specific estimates of the value of statistical life. Now, we don't take a view on which value of statistical life estimate are uh, the correct values um, and whether there really is a substantial difference between countries. We think that's very controversial. All we're doing is highlighting here that um, making different, different assumptions, you know, which are all um, you know, all very plausible assumptions can give you very different results. Um, but as we say, the Greenstone and Nigram estimates are by no means the highest in the literature. The other thing we would highlight is even under very low um, estimates of the value of statistical life, the estimated value of containment policies um, is very, very high. So even the lower, rest, lower bounds there are sort of in the order of 10% of GDP, which is a very high estimate. So that's the benefit of, benefit of containment policies. That then has to be way up, weighed up against the economic cost of these policies. Now, not a lot of work has been done on quantifying these costs. 
one very crude exercise that, that you can do is to do a kind of a difference in difference analysis that we do in the middle panel there. Where what we do is just take IMF forecasts of GDP growth constructed in January before the virus, the effects of the virus were readily appreciated and compare those to estimates constructed later in April. And just focusing there on the middle uh, set of estimates for the middle panel, so advanced economies, so comparable to what we've got in the left-hand panel. The downgrade in GDP growth estimates for 2020 between January and April is about eight percentage points. So substantial, but less than the estimated value of the social distancing policies we see in the left panel. Now, this exercise, this crude difference in difference in exercise, almost certainly overstates the effects of containment policies. And the reason for that is that even absent these policies, it's highly likely um, that voluntary actions by people from, from the effects of the pandemic would have led to a downgrade uh, in GDP growth anyway. So that's cost benefit analysis. The second tool that economists have used um, to analyze the effects of containment policies are what are known as SIR macro models. Essentially what these models do is take an, an SIR epidemiological model, which maps the virus as it transmits through an economy, um, the, the effect of that virus on the on susceptible individuals who have not contracted the virus and so are susceptible to it, infected individuals who are currently infected with the virus and recovered individuals who have recovered from the virus and augments that, that model with a very bare bones um, RBC macroeconomic model. Now, the reason why you would, might, might be interested in doing this is that the macro model can account for behavioral responses to the virus. So it can give you a sense of what voluntary actions of individuals to protect themselves from a virus might look like. It also allows you to be explicit about where the externalities might lie and what role there might be for policy in addition to voluntary actions from individuals. Now, a number of these kinds of models have been put together. They differ in the specific details, but kind of the core messages that come out of these models are very similar. What we do in our paper is just take one of these models off the shelf, one of the most sort of simple and straightforward ones, and run three scenarios through the model uh, for, for a generic pandemic that we, we calibrate roughly uh, to replicate what we thought COVID would look like when we were constructing the model. If we were to do it today, we would make it look a little bit less severe. Now we run three scenarios through this model. The first one, which we term a myopic scenario, is one in which individuals in the model either don't realize there's a virus or take no active steps to avoid becoming infected from the virus. Now, in that case, the effect of the virus on economic activity is very small. It effectively occurs just because some individuals get sick and are unable to work. COVID is a virus that is particularly, has particularly strong effects on elderly individuals who have largely left the labor force. So the effect of, direct effect of the virus through labor supply is very, very small. Um, nonetheless, the virus passes through the economy. It has quite substantial health outcomes. And so you can see there in the middle panel, you know, a large number of people die from the virus. In the second case, the precautionary case, we allow individuals to be aware of the virus and to respond to it in order to protect themselves against the adverse health outcomes, health effects of being infected by the virus. But they don't take account of the effects of their own actions on other individuals. What occurs in this case is that at the peak of the virus, when a lot of individuals are infected, people take active steps to avoid becoming infected themselves. Essentially, when a lot of people are infected, when health uh, facilities are being overrun, uh, when there's a few constraints, you engage in less, in less economic activity. You work from home, you don't work, you consume less, 
in order, order to avoid becoming infected yourself. These voluntary responses lead to a sharp fall in GDP and because fewer people are getting infected, fewer people die from the virus. In the third case, what we term the benevolent case, we simulate the model taking these externalities into account. So not only taking account of the direct effect of the virus on individual health outcomes, but also taking account of the fact that when people go out and engage in economic and social activity, they could spread the virus to other people. When we solve the economy, taking account of these other externalities that individuals might, might not internalize, the optimal response involves a much sharper decrease in economic activity and a much earlier decrease. And the reason for that is that uh, initially when the number of infected individuals is very small, there's not a lot of individual reason to avoid uh, engaging act in economic activity in order to engage, avoid social, social contact because your own effects, your own likelihood of becoming infected is very small. But when individuals engage in those activities, the virus transmits through the economy much, through, through society much faster, the number of individuals infected is much higher and the effect of that on, on health facilities is much greater. Essentially congestion is much higher. So taking account of these effects uh, results in a much optimally much smaller um, level of economic activity with much sort of very substantial health benefits shown there in the middle panel. Now, the kind of optimal effect that we get here is equivalent to about 25% of GDP. A range of other studies using more sophisticated models have come up with, with similar kind of numbers. Um, interestingly, this is also the kind of numbers that you get from the cost benefit analysis that I mentioned before. The final thing that we do in this paper and what I'll finish up on is just to note some of the limitations and caveats of this work. And I'll just highlight three. The first is that there is a lot that we don't know about the virus and particularly there's a lot more than we didn't know back in February and March when people were designing these policies. We don't know a lot about uh, how infectious the virus is, what the mortality rate is, uh, its seasonality, amongst a range of other factors. So, you know, our epidemiological knowledge is, is, is very low and we have to be cognizant of that. The second thing is that there's still a lot that we don't know about the policy response to the virus. So what kind of policy responses are going to be most effective in containing the virus? When you are not aware of that, the natural thing to do is to engage in very, very blunt tools, widespread lockdowns. But as we learn more about it, you know, you'd think that the optimal thing is going to involve a more targeted set of policy responses. The final thing to note is that the models that we're using to analyze the policy responses are very stylized. You know, compared to the kind of models that we use to analyze monetary or fiscal policy, they're very, very limited. And so, you know, I think we have to be very cautious about interpreting the quantitative predictions of these models. I think the kind of general messages we get out of them about the externalities and so on are likely to apply in any setting. But, you know, in terms of what specific kind of lockdowns are going to be optimal, I think that we have to be very, um, very cautious about taking, taking the predictions or recommendations of these models literally. Um, with that, Renee, I'll hand over to, to James. Great. Uh, thank you, Daniel. So we'll turn it over to James now. Thank you for having me on this panel. It's really actually quite a pleasure to be on the panel with um, both Dan and Hilda. Um, and great to have a chance to see them. So let me just do that. Yeah, that's full screen mode. And then let me here share the screen. Okay. Um, there, does that work now? Is that the full yeah. screen mode now? Yeah, great. So um, I, I figured Dan was going to talk about his uh, really uh, insightful um, piece, uh, the BIS, summarizing um, a lot of the literature on how to think about these trade-offs uh, in the costs, uh, uh, both cost-benefit analysis and structural 
macro models that uh, bring epidemiological assumptions into them. Um, so I won't talk as much about those, uh, but I did, because this is a panel discussion on policy choices, I did want to talk about policy and also to some extent, um, you know, I think Dan actually said it exactly right that well, we use those macro quantitative models to think about um, the trade-offs. Um, we should have some skepticism over exact quantitative uh, results given that they're highly stylized models and we're calibrating the parameters. But they do give strong insights, um, including uh, the, the, the fundamental result that I think comes across a lot of those macro models that you want to front load um, uh, lockdowns, uh, our, our containment policies, um, and that um, uh, it basically, that's that's a fundamental result that that seems to happen in a lot of it. And of course, that maybe naturally, if you're able to target uh, policies more selectively, um, the containment policies, then that's better than if it's a one size fits all. But I'm not going to talk about that as much, um, except to the extent that I think that whole literature fits into um, this this narrative here. Oops, uh, there. Um, that we, we're seeing in the media in Australia, and I think even globally, um, that there is just this basic trade-off between uh, the economy and and um, and the health response. Um, so these are just headlines from the Australian newspapers from this morning. Um, Australia now is quite clearly in a recession. Uh, I think that was pretty obvious, but the numbers for the first quarter of, of the, the year came out for GDP and it was negative even in the first quarter before the, the, uh, the crisis really took hold. Um, and so uh, since it will clearly be negative in the second quarter, we're in a technical recession, but we're just obviously in a recession as it is. So the Australian says the cost of beating the virus is recession. Um, uh, the financial review maybe takes something a more generous approach to whether that might have been a good idea, but they say Australia's recession is the price of humanity. So that's the, the narrative uh, that we see in the media and in a lot of discussions. And I, I would say my view is I think that narrative is vastly oversimplified. Um, it's basically wrong in, in my view, and I'll talk about why. And I think it's a, it's a somewhat dangerous narrative um, in the sense that um, it may lead to bad decisions in the future when we have, if we have similar sorts of outbreaks. Um, so there we go. What I think the, the real policy choice is, that's what I wanted to talk about in terms of the panel. So first, um, but just to reiterate that trade-offs with public health measures that are obviously designed to quote unquote flatten the curve are almost always framed in terms of the cost being the cost of recession. Um, with the, the, the consequences that come with recession. So not just the output loss, although Dan mentioned that that's a, a, a basic measure people might look at, um, but job losses um, are obviously important, but even potentially health, health outcomes, although the evidence on what those are in recessions is mixed, but things like suicide is an extreme example. Um, worries about that uh, these, these containment measures may have led lead to high uh, suicide rates, people that projected that were looking at pa past recessions and projecting what might happen in the future. Um, but the key thing is what is to understand in terms of the trade-offs and the policy choices, what, what is actually due to the virus versus due to the containment measures. And Dan alluded to that in terms of uh, already you might not think the full cost of recession can be put onto the containment measures. Um, so it's the counterfactual that matters. If you didn't employ um, particular containment measures, what would, it, what would have happened? And I would argue the, uh, a global recession seems like it was inevitable um, given coordination issues, at least that, uh, you know, if you would think about how different countries would respond, um, that's gonna immediately raise coordination the issues are within a country and so forth. And, and given the private responses that, that Dan uh, alluded to that economists introduce into epidemiological models that people will choose uh, to respond um, by changing their economic behavior and that, that alone could lead to recession. Um, you know, examples could be Sweden where there's a coordination issue, I suppose, about opening, keeping borders open or not keeping borders open and, 
uh, but there's also um, uh, you know private responses as well that there will be um, I, likely as severe of a recession there as as um, in countries that had more restrictive policies, or say within the U.S. Um, you know states where uh, people value their liberty particularly highly and may have ignored uh, restrictions early on at least. Um, you know, we see the unemployment rate is shot up just as badly and in those states as in other states where um, containment measures were, were followed more. Um, or Australia, I'll just give the example, the fact that there was, uh, the recession clearly started in the first quarter. Uh, well, that was, suggests it's not just due to um, uh, the, the crisis, it, it partly due to the bushfires in Australia, but also um, it's due to the fact that there was COVID-19 in China and China is a major, um, trading partners. So uh, that's a, it gets to the coordination issue that, that it, the, the cost of the containment measures in Australia were not the entire recession that we faced. Uh, so what matters, the real policy choice, is what's going to be the long run consequence of the, the COVID-19 recession. And I would argue those are not yet determined and, and they're going to depend not so much just on um, how uh, we think about health and containment measures, but they're going to depend on the fiscal policy responses. So if we think that negative health outcomes are the consequence of a severe recession, um, job losses that might have been temporary become permanent, then the question is what's going to happen in the long run from this recession? Will those job losses be temporary or permanent? Um, why do I say fiscal policy? Uh, well, first, I don't, I think as I've already tried to argue, the decisions to ease lockdown should not be just based on this, these economic trade-offs. They should primarily be guided by health and social considerations. Uh, we should listen to the experts, the epidemiological experts. Um, and it's not to say we shouldn't try to ease lockdowns where we can because there's obviously huge social benefits uh, to doing so. Um, but the decision shouldn't just be channeled or, or framed in terms of economic benefits. Um, fiscal policy though, as opposed to monetary policy, um, comes up because monetary policy clearly is currently quite limited uh, in many countries by the effective lower bound, including Australia. And uh, even to the extent um, central banks can pursue unconventional policies, um, uh, we already have very low long-term interest rates. So the ability to just uh, bring down long-term interest rates, uh, there's only a limited amount that, that one can do there. Um, I, I guess it's probably worth saying, um, whether it's obvious to, uh, to everyone in, in the same way, I think there would be a strong arguments to say that the economy is not just going to self-adjust back to uh, potential output, back to, to where we were before the crisis quickly um, and certainly not just due to um, things like tax or industrial relations reforms that um, seem to be the focus in politics domestically in Australia right now or spontaneous private investment. Um, I think the, the risk we face is instead uh, the opposite that there could be a debt deflationary spiral where we'll see already there's uh, disinflation, uh, possible deflation in, in Australia in the second quarter, the US in uh, past few months has had deflation. Um, this is clearly going to feed into wages. If you have lower wages and prices, that leads to higher real debt. Um, and of course, uh, that defaults will occur in, in severe recessions as it is. Um, and the other thing that we, we've seen from um, the, the literature in economics is that uh, past pandemics seem to have very per persistent economic effects primarily through um, affecting higher precautionary savings. So this is uh, Oscar Jordan co-authors have looked at a number of past pandemics and find that when you've got the greater uncertainty like we do now, there's higher precautionary saving. Um, that's relevant for fiscal policy because um, it, I don't think it's gonna feed into this, this boom of private investment, but it would keep the cost of fiscal stimulus low. Um, I put lower because uh, Australia, of course, has a lot of fiscal capacity um, other countries, maybe not as much um, if they start with higher uh, debt to GDP ratios, but, but because of this mass worldwide precautionary saving that I think we'll see, um, fiscal stimulus will be less costly than otherwise. So I want to talk um, a bit more about 
that uh, policy, fiscal policy, and and how it relates to what we've learned from the past in more of an empirical literature. So Dan's of course covered the response in terms of theoretical modeling um, to the crisis, and and we've definitely learned things from that. But we we can learn from the empirical literature what's happened in the past. That example of of uh, the Oscar Jorda and the effects on precautionary saving of pandemics is an example of that. But more broadly, um, we know. Uh, about the effects of recessions, um, and uh, are there's certainly been a lot of empirical analysis into that. And one of the things that I would argue we've learned, um, certainly have in a, a recent paper with uh, Yun Jung Oh, is the idea that uh, not all recessions are alike. There are different types of recessions in terms of specifically what their permanent effects are. Some do seem to have hysteresis effects in the long run very persistent or even permanent effects, but others do have more of a recovery. Um, and that seems to be fairly stochastic is what we find when we estimate models that allow uh, for different types of recessions. So what is this recession gonna be? Which kind is it? This is where the people get a bit into this language of L or U. Uh, I think the letter of the alphabet's not so relevant as much as what are the permanent effects are gonna be. That we don't know yet. Um, but what we do know is that even in the case where they aren't as permanent in, in terms of the effects, but it's a deep recession, and even if you've got a full recovery, there's still large economic costs to the extent that there seems to be asymmetry in the business cycle. What I mean by that is that the loss of output during the recession isn't going to be made up at some point in, in the future with a, a big boom above potential. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence that in industrialized economies, business cycle asymmetry is fairly pervasive, at least historically, and I would expect it to be in this case. Another thing, uh, which there, of course, will always be debates amongst economists about um, uh, the effects of fiscal stimulus, um, but one of the reasons for the debates is that it, there's growing evidence um, uh, our back in Grudnichenko, my uh, papers, I, earlier paper with Steve Fazari and Irina Panofska and others, uh, find state-dependent effects of fiscal policy. And what, what we find in particular, especially in a more recent uh, paper, is that both for tax policy and government spending, um, those state-dependent effects are very much related to the degree of economic slack. That's a, that's a major driver. And when there's a large degree of slack, um, then fiscal stimulus is, is most effective at that time. Now, we're in an unusual recession. Everyone knows this is not just sort of maybe a traditional recession if you think of being driven purely by aggregate demand shocks. It's a mix of supply and demand shocks. Um, or as uh, Guerrieri et al. referred to it, as a, it's a Keynesian supply shock. Um, and a, an aspect of a Keynesian supply shock is um, it, you restrict part of the economy, that's going to spill over and lead to what looks like an aggregate demand collapse for the, the whole economy. Um, but in that setting, when you've restricted the economy, traditional multipliers or fiscal stimulus don't work um, as, as effectively. The multiplier is smaller, at least when you're in the lockdown stage. And so they argue for using social insurance policies as the way to to address. So that's maybe less empirical, but a theoretical point they make, but one that we've seen play out um, uh, in action recently in many, many countries, including countries you might not have expected to uh, embrace social insurance policies to that extent. Um, but the point is, once the restrictions ease, it, I think uh, it would be fair to say that, that we will need sustained stimulus um, and since monetary policy is less available, I think we need now forward guidance about this uh, sustained stimulus, given what appear to be very, very large negative output gaps. And, and um, I just uh, had a recent paper with uh, Tino Berger and, and Ben Wong uh, looking at trying to now cast the output gap. And uh, I'll advertise that here. But one of the points of, of the paper is just how dramatic the, the collapse of, of output has been, or seems to be, and what we're able to do is track that in, in real time uh, terms. So within the quarter, um, so we don't have the GDP data yet for the second quarter, but how do we know we're in recession? Well, all of the, the higher frequency indicators are, are suggesting not only is a recession, but the, the magnitude of it is, is unprecedented. So we look at the US context, um, 
and uh, depending on different assumptions about you know what employment growth is going to be in, in, in future uh, months, uh, we get quite a dramatic um, decrease in in the output gap. Uh, so there looks to be a lot of potential um, for fiscal stimulus to try to um, have its bigger multiplier effects once uh, restrictions ease. Uh, we haven't looked at directly at the Australian data. We plan to. Uh, there's a lot less high frequency data, um, but I did want to talk about one because I think it gets to this idea of, of um, uh, that we shouldn't just assume the simple trade-off. Um, one high frequency measure, uh, which is very important in, in terms of this uh, US data as well, is consumer sentiment. And um, I would put it that we've seen a, a tale of two countries by comparing uh, the Australian experience and the US experience. And uh, this is on, if the scale is small for you to see, it's on the same scale for Australia and the US consumer sentiment since 2017 bumping around 100, 100 um, both indices. Um, but then we have, of course, the crisis hits and a, a big collapse for Australia. But then we see a partial recovery uh, from that collapse uh, in May. And Australia, of course, has experienced a very uh, low medical crisis uh, as a result of those containment policies. And, and one can imagine the idea that, that stimulus could be more effective in an environment where there's a recovery in sentiment. The US, by contrast, um, has an even bigger collapse in sentiment, uh, sort of a record-breaking collapse over such a short time frame. And in May, it flatlined more. And, and in the US, of course, we're still seeing a rise in numbers of cases and, and deaths and so forth. So, um, so this idea that there's just this trade-off, uh, I think, uh, is, is called into to, to question. So the policy conclusions that I would make in terms of the policy choices we have is that um, it would appear from you know, the counterfactual matters, but we have some evidence on counterfactuals or to the extent we can try to compare across countries. And it appears that avoiding a medical crisis is better for economic and it's certainly better for other outcomes. Um, Australia versus the US is the example I've used. There are of course gonna be big issues with that specific example, but you can think of other examples and perhaps Hilda can inform us on, on uh, some of the examples uh, where you have more similarities across countries as well. Um, the second policy conclusion I'd make is that rather than thinking about containment measures as the only policy instrument, which is often how this public discourse uh, has taken it, um, to deal with economic outcomes, policymakers need to focus on, on fiscal policy uh, as an al alternative instrument um, and, and a more sensible one to address the um, the economic consequences of the virus, uh, but also to try to mitigate uh, some of the, the negative social consequences of recessions that, that we see. We need to mitigate the recession. And then um, the, the last sort of thing is that the output gap appears to be very negative, maybe more negative, uh, is say, in the U.S. than it would be in Australia, where we do uh, look at a now cast measure for Australia. Uh, and so that's going to require sustained fiscal stimulus uh, to avoid a debt deflationary spiral. At least those are my thoughts on it. So thanks, I'll stop there. Great, uh, thank you, James. So we will now turn to Hilda for her presentation. Okay, so um, assuming you can both see and hear me, Hilda, if there's uh, any issues there. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's great to be here and I really, really enjoy seeing uh, uh, seeing and hearing James and Dan and, and Rene. And uh, it seems like ages since I was in Australia, but it was only in December. So uh, the world has really changed uh, since then. Um, um, but I see that from the discussion I hear from, from James and Dan, I, I think there's a lot of similar issues that we are uh, obviously struggling with, but uh, obviously there's a lot of similarity in how we think and deal with the crisis uh, across across the globe, and in particular in, in small open economies like Norway and Australia. So my focus, given that I knew more or less what the other would be talking about, would be exactly to think of a global crisis uh, and uh, uh, policy choices in small open economies uh, and, and what to think more in terms of what, what's the role ahead of us now. So let me just start by the obvious, uh, but uh, I think 
I don't know how it is in Australia, but I think that even in Norway, we need to keep as a college reminding uh, others that this is a global crisis. This is not just happening in Norway because we can get very focused on everything which is happening here and how many are ill, how many are infected and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So this is a truly global crisis. Uh, and since the outbreak started in, in China in December, the disease has now spread to more than, I think, 200 countries and territories. Uh, and the epicenter from China to Europe to US and then, and then now in Brazil. And obviously in the absence of vaccine or treatment, the governments worldwide have responded by implementing these unprecedented containment and mitigation measures. And uh, when the crisis started in China and they started with this, um, this lockdown, uh, as I might call it, uh, I think most people, at least in Europe, thought that, well, if this would be the case in Europe, it would never happen that we would be able to, to close down the economy as they do, as they have done in China. But as it turns out, that's what we have seen more or less, but obviously at varying scales across the world. Uh, and I think that uh, I recognize very much a debate that, Jaim, that James alluded to in his presentation, namely the, the, the focus on the cost of, of, uh, of the lockdown, and I'll, I'll get back to that. Uh, but I think that as one in particular from in Europe, as we saw how the crisis evolved in, in, in Southern Europe at first, um, it became obvious that without any containment that uh, the health system would break down and, the, and then abiding to this, uh, this measure w w became by itself uh, uh, something that uh, I think most people understand that they have to do, uh, at least in, in, in a stabilized uh, economy. Uh, and I think also that uh, um, uh, people's incentives, people's uh, fright of the, uh, of the disease uh, should not be uh, underestimated because that itself uh, has made many people even respond stronger than what the government sometimes have uh, suggested. By taking uh, children out of kindergarten before even lockdown and, and, and not going out at all. Um, so uh, this obviously has uh, resulted in a lot of economic losses, but then again, it's important to emphasize uh, from, uh, from a small open economy perspective that even without those, we would have had a severe hit to the economy uh, because the global economy is closed up. So even if we had responded differently, and I, you will see that for Sweden in a second. So, but first, um, uh, obviously with all this measure, it's, it's, um, um, the question is, did the measures work in terms of reducing uh, people infected? And although that's not my field to, to discuss that, I'm happy that I, <laughs> IMF has uh, at least uh, reported some uh, new studies, and there are studies showing that um, the, con the, the containment did work in terms of uh, reducing confirmed deaths, which you see on the left-hand side here, that lives, sa lives have been saved with this containment across the world. Uh, and that's obviously important in the sense that uh, by having people moving less around, uh, more people, uh, or less people got ill, and therefore, therefore the cost to the society of huge uh, infections uh, became uh, smaller. Uh, so it did work in the sense of, redu uh, of reducing death, in reducing death, and, and in terms of uh, preventing people from becoming ill. And we also saw that local condition matters, or this study shows, uh, reported by MEP, that. Um, the containment efforts were even more effective in countries which had certain characteristics, and among those countries with low temperature, uh, Norway is one of those, <laughs> uh, high share of old people, uh, low population density, uh, and also a strong health system and a greater social distancing. So these are the kind of things which made um, the containment work uh, most effective. Uh, Interesting though, uh, as you might have picked up, uh, Sweden and Norway have chosen very different approaches where Norway has, uh, like Denmark also, locked down the economy uh, quite severely, uh, starting from the 12th of March by taking children out of kindergarten, uh, uh, schools, uh, people uh, working have to work from home in, except in critical jobs. 
uh, and uh, all kind of public uh, gathering uh, where, where more, for more than five people were closed. So you see here, Denmark and Norway, from this Google Mobility Report, who tracks uh, how people move around, we see that people in transit were moving uh, fell dramatically from the middle of March in Sweden and sorry, in Denmark and Norway by around 6 to 70 percent. But interestingly, interestingly, even in Sweden, it fell quite sharply, uh, although a bit more gradually, by around 40 to 50 percent. So even though in Sweden they didn't impose this lockdown, still Swedish uh, population behaved more in, in the sense of um, they reduced their activity themselves, voluntarily, you might say, but uh, uh, also because the government emphasized that uh, you need to have some social distancing, uh, but they, they did so voluntarily. Uh, and whether that was um, uh, a social duty or whether it was because they were afraid of becoming ill, uh, I don't know, but it's really important in terms of thinking of the models, which also uh, Dan emphasized that it's not just about forced lockdown, it's also the fact that um, if you want to think about the different measures you, you, you need to impose and you want to think about macroeconomic outcomes, you cannot underestimate the fact that incentives in, 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 in uh, households, um, uh, individuals will be an important factor behind how, how they respond. So uh, as, a, as an outcome of that, obviously you will see that uh, because activity either voluntary or involuntary are reduced due to the, uh, the, these measures, uh, you will see that activity uh, globally uh, has fallen in all countries. Uh, and this graph shows that manufacturing in, in both Sweden and Norway fell in, in, in the first two months, March to April, and in, in Sweden even more so, which I think relates to the industry structure rather than the lockdown. Uh, but you see that um, the global effect of uh, obviously restrictions on travel, restrictions on trade and, and production uh, means that you have a, a setback in, in all countries in terms of production or manufacturing production. But the sector obviously most affected is services because of the social distancing uh, and there also Sweden uh, uh, has uh, reported uh, quite a severe setback in these two months, February, March, or from February to April, but obviously even more so in countries like uh, France, Italy, etc. So most countries are going to see a severe hit uh, independent of the lockdown or not. Uh, and the big question then, which I'll get back to at the end, is maybe is, is to see uh, to see the not just see the cost of the lockdown in terms of um, closing down society and activity, but also see the benefit in the sense that who can open up first now? Who can where can we expect activity to increase? Which relates to what James was also talking about. Um, one thing about uh, uh, what to expect. So James talked about no cuts and it's hard to make predictions. And I totally agree that it's really hard to make prediction these days because not only is our model out of sync with, uh, with how we should think, but uh, um, the relationship between the variables and even the measurement of the variables are, uh, are, are changing these days. So consumer price index, for instance, how can you measure uh, the prices of services when there are no services there? Um, and also in terms of uh, the no cost, where are we today? It's really hard to say where we are today when we can't even measure it and everything comes with delay. So to emphasize a little bit on the kind of research uh, I'm involved in, um, we use uh, text data uh, to make macro prediction where we measure sentiment reported in the newspaper related to different kinds of activities. And then in this crisis, we have reported the sentiment index um, which we call the financial news index every uh, every week, uh, which has been an important input into um, the kind of uh, measuring the activity in the Norwegian economy. And these figures, which is one of the ones we produce, we show we showed early in the crisis that uh, the red one is the Corona crisis that activity has had gone down at the same scale as the financial crisis, which is the black one. Uh, and as a comparison, we also have a steamy black one, which is the uh, which is the oil crisis we had in particular in Norway in 2040. So very quickly, we could see that the um, the Corona crisis in Norway, within days after the crisis, uh, 
gitt nå var gjennom lockdown, hadde magnitude i lang med et national press. But still, that might not even be enough. And, and uh, going ahead, um, thinking where we are going uh, ahead, obviously we have to think more about what's happening globally. Because one thing is what we do in Norway, and now the social distancing measures are, uh, we are easing on those, as many other countries are doing. Uh, but what's, what is, um, what's to expect going ahead? Uh, and I've been involved in the government commission in Norway, where we have looked at uh, different scenarios going forward and made recommendations to the government about uh, the different costs for the different strategies going forward. And we have calculated the economic cost going forward of uh, holding down now, um, as we call it, a scenario holding down, where, we are, look, where we, are, we are saying that the infection rate should not increase above one, meaning that you not, should not increase more than uh, one per person which means that you have to keep on with the social distancing and, and infection protection and testing and isolation. Uh, and the economic cost of such a strategy for the next year, uh, we have shown have been, will, be low, will be less than a, a strategy, which we call just to slow down, which means that you will allow infection to go up quite a bit before you in, impose on new measures. And this economic commission, which is called the Holding Commission, by named after the leader, shows that one of the issues with choosing like um, a slowdown um, strategy rather than uh, a hold down strategy is that when people will see that infection rates go up again, that more people die, they will self-impose uh, this restriction again because of fear and uh, um, of being affected. So even though if you don't impose restriction, you will see that. Uh, household will behave as with the restriction as we have even seen in Sweden. So we uh, recommended then um, a strategy of continuing of holding down and going forward. Uh, but not holding down in terms of letting people, not having um, children in school and kindergarten. These activities should be now kept open, but uh, to, to keep on the social distancing, uh, meaning some restrictions on how uh, how many people are to be in the room, for instance. So, so that's our recommendation to, to, to the government. And in the way forward, I, uh, I agree very much with, with James. I don't want to go into much detail on that, but fiscal policy is going to be important. Uh, monetary policy is effectively at, the, at zero now also in Norway. So uh, we are not going to have a lot of stimulus there. Uh, but it's also important to emphasize that fiscal policy measures have to be temporary. Uh, yes, they must keep activity going, but they must also send the right incentives. Because some of the fiscal, me fiscal measures we have in place in Norway have uh, given an uh, incentive which has been maybe too encouraging in the sense of um, not engaging in activity. So, uh, to, very briefly, um, you will get the compensation for a loss of production if your production is down by 30%. Uh, how, um, however, if it's not, if it's only done by 25%, you don't get that compensation. So obviously, it will be an incentive for the firms to cut production even more just to get that compensation. So having 29 versus 30%. Uh, so we have uh, suggested some um, uh, fiscal. We have suggested some changes to these fiscal policy measures, which should also give a right incentive to increase activity. So there's a balance there between compensation and also increased activity. But still, I want to emphasize that uh, there's a limit for how much you can expect fiscal policy to compensate in a small open economy. I want to emphasize very much the global and the regional factors in, in driving business cycles and make prediction going forward. And here are a couple of work I've been involved with, with uh, Norwegian and Italian authors, uh, where it's really the important, where we show that in all well, most countries, but in particular small open economy, a major part of the business cycles are driven by global or regional factors. So uh, to, 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 to end my presentation on this note, the, the big question now is then who is the locom locomotive now or the driver who's in the, in the driving seat now? Uh, and that's where I'm a little bit uh, concerned with, um, with the prospect for the small open economy. Uh, and, uh, because what we see now, and I, I must have emphasized, is that during this great lockdown, all countries are affected negatively, uh, even the emerging countries. 
So if you see to the left here, uh, you see during the Great Lockdown, both advanced and emerging countries are negative affected, whereas in the financial crisis, low, uh, emerging countries were not so negative affected. So they were the drivers to, to help the world economy out of the crisis. And you see that also in to the right here, you see that the countries China and India were really important for uh, helping uh, the world economy out of the global crisis uh, in 2009. Whereas now there's hardly any growth in these economies. So that's the issues going forward. Um, uh, global crisis, uh, but then also there's a limited help. There's some limits for how much the small open economy will, uh, 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 how much we can expect activity there going forward, as long as the world is closed. Uh, and the uh, problem is then that we are lacking uh, a, a driver in the seat or a locomotive. And I think for, for countries like Australia, Norway, China is obviously really, really important. And I think that after the financial crisis, I think both of the countries saw really that uh, being a resource rich economy with the China in the driving seat was really, really important in that sense, uh, as both global demand and energy demand increased. And I, I fear that we will not see that kind of stimulus this time. Uh, but uh, I want to still end with a, on a positive note. So low infection rates uh, can also give some cause for optimism. Uh, and the fact that uh, we have at least seen for now, it's still early to say, but seem to have succeeded by keeping infection rates uh, down in Norway uh, and Sweden, it means that now we can open up more to, 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 to each other. So um, the government has now decided that borders between Denmark and Norway can now open up for activity. But still, between Sweden and Norway, it, it's not open because of a uh, much higher infection rate in Sweden. So that's something we obviously didn't think about um, when this started in back two months, three months ago. But that's something we see now to be an important part of the opening up, namely that countries with has, who have succeeded in keeping infection rates can actually be expected to have um, quicker recovery going back, despite very strong measures. Okay, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Great, thank you, Hilda. Um, could I now please ask James and Daniel to rejoin the panel? Um, now we have some time for questions. So I'm going to invite um, Joachim Vespignani, who is the co-director of um, the COVID-19 in the macro economy, to join the panel, as well as Warwick McKibben and Joel Bowman. Would you all like to turn on your um, cameras and, and microphones? So this is for our first round of questions. So uh, we'll start off with Joaquin. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, I have a question for James. Um, you know, the new hot spot for viruses is South America, um, where situation is difficult because even uh, a social a social distance policy is difficult. It's difficult to work because a uh, good percentage of population work in the black market. Uh, and also the the fiscal position and the given that they always this country have high debt and uh, uh, not independent central banks and um, and very high risk uh, premium. Um, what do you think the the policy the fiscal policy options there? Uh, what's um, I mean, you know I, I got, you know it's very easy to see the case for Australia low debt and also very low interest rate. That's 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 clear situation, but for South America it seems to be much more challenging, and I just would like to hear your opinion. Yeah, no, that's a great question, Joaquin. Um, and I think the situation is often more challenging for Latin America economically. So, uh, so that's perhaps not new here. I, my sense is it that can alter the trade-off. It's not quite as easy as say for Australia with a lot of fiscal capacity to just go and um, try to use that as the main economic response. Um, but it gets to a coordination issue, which is, I don't think that the solution is therefore just to let it rip in Argentina or Brazil or so forth, that the, the, the human consequences of that can actually uh, be quite depressive in terms of economic activity. Um, you know, the trade-offs that Dan raised still would suggest that even if we have some lost economic activity, it's still not worth the, the loss in, in, in life to, to uh, ease restrictions too soon or not impose enough uh, 
But the coordination issue is, I think it's, this really is going to call on uh, countries that have the capacity, not just to help themselves out, but to actually try to, um, you know, have some, uh, just like we do domestically, some debt relief measures or delaying on debt, debt payments have some more foreign aid, not less, you know, think of it as a Marshall plan for, um, for COVID we're, we're going to need. And Australia probably is in a better position than say the US or a lot of economies because it has such a low debt to GDP ratio to start. But the point of that is the coordination point is that really the only way we can get out of it is if a number of countries um, engage in trying to uh, reopen borders when in a bubble, at least when there is um, when when situation safe so like the south pacific islands here that's a big issue can we have a, them part of the bubble along with uh, australia and new zealand i think that's important to do um but yeah no i i think the trade-offs and the, the economic challenges are are clearly more uh difficult in in latin america but i just don't think that means that you automatically would go to just let's let's open up and um allow the 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 virus to spread quickly Great. Um, thank you, Joachim. We'll now turn to Joel Bowman to ask his question. Joel is a PhD student at the ANU. Thank you, Renee. Um, thank you, Hilda, James, and Dan for, that, uh, for those presentations. I certainly think it's great seeing uh, work which actually highlights the, the economic benefits of the containment measures that a lot of uh, countries have undertaken. Um, I just had a couple of questions I'd be interested in hearing the panel's views on. Uh, the first is, uh, which countries uh, do you think have actually got the policy, uh, the policy response right or severely wrong during the COVID-19 outbreak, given the competing trade-offs, um, which many of you mentioned before, and also within the context of the kind of available policy space that, that countries have? The second question, uh, what are the intergenerational implications uh, associated with the stimulus measures adopted by uh, governments and central banks? Who would like to take um, those interesting questions? I'm happy to start. You can hear me? Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, great questions and things that uh, that we are debating a lot. Uh, I think that, so obviously you could hear from my presentation and obviously from the fact that we recommended in the uh, commission that uh, measure which uh, that the economic benefit of containment are larger than maybe we even thought of because people will I think that people will behave even as we as if they were as if they wanted the containment if, if, if that's not the case so that's obviously uh, that's obviously in a society which has good health system and good uh, social security network and where people don't where people have their income guarantee their income more or less so that's obviously in in countries like typically like Norway and Australia where 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 you have uh, the social security which which take care of you if, even though if you have to close down the society and i think that it, it's a little bit hard to say whether what kind of measure you should take across the world and it's still a little bit early but for 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 developed economies i think that i, I think that uh, economic measures uh, are the oh sorry containment measures have the least economic cost uh, at least that's, that's my view on that uh, but i want to say um, to, to, to make it also a, a note about the intergeneration measures because that's a really interesting um, or that's a really important aspect of it because obviously it affects young people in particular those who have to take up be taken out of school and out of university very differently than say us who can can be here in our office and do work as as, as, as we do but for young people i think that the cost of being affected from not going to school cost of uh, not being able to um, to study efficiently uh, as, as they used to. I think that we don't really know the cost of that, but I see that there are studies who show us that the cost of the young people are actually quite huge from this. So uh, I think that's going to be a, a lot of interesting research into that going forward. Thank you, Hilda. Uh, Warwick McKibben, next question. Thanks very much, Renee. Thanks to the panelists um, for excellent presentations. Uh, I had a question, I had a couple of questions. I had one for Dan and one for James. So Dan, I mean, there's different approaches out there to looking at this issue. One is to take 
epidemiological models and to put on a theoretical model over the top, uh, which is what Eichenbaum and everybody has done. The alternative is to take very large scale detailed economic models and build the epidemiological um, shocks into those models, which is what we did in the seven scenario paper. It seems if you want to quantify these things, you have to focus a lot on the economic detail and you don't really get the quantification, as you say, from a theoretical model sitting on top of an epidemiological model. So I wonder why you ignored this other approach. And the, third, the fourth approach actually is the agent-based modeling, which was presented here last week by, by Ross Hammond. But there's a lot of really interesting agent-based modeling out there. So I think from a central bank's point of view, I would have thought quantification was more important than theory, but I just leave that for you to, to discuss. Um, for James and probably Hilda as well, um, Really interesting issue, and I, I agree completely that fiscal policy has an important role. I think, and Hilda touched on this, is the issue of financing of the fiscal policy is really interesting. Now, one of the problems we have in Australia and in most countries is when you have a crisis, you throw money at it. And most of that money actually turns out to go to people who didn't actually have a crisis in the first place. So what you do need to do is switch, I think, the financing from grants and, and gifts to some sort of income and uh, revenue contingent loans. And, and so I think, you know, to get your reaction, James, don't you think we should extend job keeper and job um, uh, creator, all the different job programs to be financed by income contingent loans so the winners get to pay back and the people that don't survive uh, don't, you know, eventually they don't have to therefore pay back a loan. The reason that's important is because the loan take up through the Reserve Bank and the banks generally was very low as you expect, because it's low during droughts as well, because farmers don't know when they're gonna be able to pay these loans back. So I'd be very interested in your comments about the financing and how important it is to have that in, in the discussion of fiscal policy. Thanks. Daniel, would you like to start? Yeah, um, so great question, Warwick. Um, so in terms of why we focus specifically on cost benefit analysis and the SIR macro models, to be honest, we had a we had a six page limit, and that's what we could we could fit in. Um, if we had a bit more space, we certainly would have covered uh, the kind of kind of work that you put out, um, as well as potentially the agent based models as well. Um, you know, the easy answer to all these things is we want more models, and it's more different kinds of models, like you suggest. Um, so you know what what these SAR models give you over models that you know maybe have a more the more more detailed macro focus is, you know, especially for you know thinking about a new disease in a way we maybe haven't done before. You know, a model where you can sort of specifically highlight the externalities, highlight the mechanisms. You know, I, I think in this context has a lot of use. Now, where should this literature go next? It absolutely has to be in the direction you you point out, um, either in terms of making these Eichenbaum type models. You know, larger and richer, um, more in the direction of you know, a G cube type of model, or trying to build more of an epidemiological structure, you know, into the G cubed type of models. Yeah, I mean, I think to get sort of meaningful quantitative predictions from these, that that's exactly what we have to do. Um, my personal impression of the agent based models is, I just don't know how to valid, validate them. And so given that I struggle to take you know, the quantitative prediction seriously, but, you know, obviously the people working with these models uh, have different opinions. So yes, the answer is we need more and more detailed models. Um, so in terms of the issue of how um, fiscal policy might be framed, uh, especially in the more social insurance type measures, um, JobKeeper in Australia being a key example, I mean, I think it, it goes without saying that that uh, one could uh, organize or, or frame it better and have better incentives involved. And I think that's uh, probably the, the way to go forward is not to abandon JobKeeper at a, a hard deadline for the whole economy and see what happens, but rather to reform it. Um, and, and having things like uh, debt contingent loans is, is sensible enough, having it more um, tied to, to uh, specific sectors or, or in, uh, income levels would make sense. Um, this does get to something, there was also a question I saw in the, in the Q&A panel on the side here uh, that's related, which is thinking about the incentives that would come from social insurance policies. 
should we have the question asked, should we have some sort of um, uh, job guarantee, you know, like in an MMT sense? Um, Hilda raised the issue of uh, fiscal policies. We might think what, make sure that a lot of them are temporary, um, maybe large and sustained, but ultimately temporary. Um, but we could imagine maybe this is a time to think about different social policies, like um, maybe not an employment guarantee, but something like a guaranteed minimum income approach or other approaches that would help uh, the economy through this time, but also uh, induce the right long-term incentives. Uh, so I think that's a it's a key, key, really good question, and not all fiscal dollars spent in the same way are the same. So uh, that's the you know that's really what uh, the government needs to be thinking very hard about is what's the most effective means of spending. But one point is that at least historically, stimulus is more effective when there's a massive excess capacity in the economy. That's tempered a bit by this being much more a service-based uh, economy now and a service-based uh, um, uh, restrictions, but, but I think, um, but I think there will be uh, things we can learn about what are more efficient policies, including around social insurance policies. But definitely job keepers should continue, but be reformed, be my short answer. I can add one thing. So uh, I, I totally agree with uh, what's been said. I think one thing we have been debating a lot in Norway, or which was also part of the, what we recommended in the commission, is that going obviously in the first stage it's about keeping businesses floating by by compensating quickly the businesses but going forward which to, to keep the incentive right we should also make sure that uh, the incentive is linked to to hiring of, of of people so that you don't don't just get compensated from cutting your cost but also that that's linked to how many people you hire back so we have suggested a a compensation system which relates uh, both to the, your fixed cost but also to the fact that you keep people working uh, in, in, in certain uh, in a certain period uh, and that should encourage uh, people not just to lay off but also to keep them there but then also making sure that uh, uh, making sure that uh, these are a company which have a future not so so they so that you keep the flexibility in the society going so that you keep job flexibility still going so, so that's what we have uh, recommended the government at the moment uh, don't want to go into these kind of more um, yeah, more technical suggestions, I could say. So they, they are still in the phase where they, are, uh, they want broad measures, which going forward, if this is going to last one or two years, I think it's going to be costly and also going to be um, maybe not giving the right incentive going forward. Because if we have the pandemic coming back in waves, you, you may want to make sure that uh, and you don't want to have companies behave uh, with the wrong incentive. Okay, great. Um, there was a follow-up question by uh, Mohammed on, on the Q and A. Um, he wants to know the minimum income guarantee is inflationary. So how can we account for that? Does anyone like to address that? Well, I guess I don't know why it would be necessarily any different uh, in being potentially inflationary than uh, many other uh, policies, but I would just quickly say that I don't think inflation's the concern right right now. In fact, if anything, um, you know, I don't think the RBA would be upset if for whatever reason we had some reason to believe that inflation might be up around two to three percent, or perhaps even run a bit uh, at the high end of their their target range or above for a while, if they wanted to implicitly target uh, nominal GDP. Um, so, so that's not necessarily the concern. At least I wouldn't target a specific policy like that as being problematic because of inflationary um, pressures or potential, uh, and that would be a problem. I think the RBA would like to have right now. We also have another question um, on the Q&A, um, and I, I might start by addressing this to Dan. Um, do the panelists have a view of the permanent eff effects of the COVID shock, especially potential GDP growth? Sure, thanks Renee. Um, so this is actually a, a really great question, and a really important one I think as we move from tackling the virus itself to in a lot of countries having contained it and thinking about how we, how we sort of chart a path to recovery. Um, so I just, I just raise a couple of points. Um, one is that you know, typically I think um, the literature has converged on the idea that recessions probably do have a permanent effect 
on the level um, of GDP. Um, so you get you get some some you know, recession calls that fall on the level of GDP. It, it, it comes back, but maybe it doesn't come back to exactly its, its previous trend. Um, and in a particularly sharp recession like we're experiencing now, I think that that's even more likely to occur. Um, now, in terms of its effect on, on GDP growth going forwards, I, I think there clearly will be some persistent effect uh, for the next little while until we, you know, until we get a vaccine. Um, so sort of there, there are some industries that have been severely affected by the virus that just aren't going to fully come back to where they were, you know, and, and until we're able to able to seriously contain this thing. Um, you know, things like tourism, um, things like some consumer services, you know, there, there are going to be restrictions on that for, for a long period of time, and that's going to have a, have a weighing effect. I, I think really, really interesting question comes, and it relates to something that Hilda just mentioned, is that the governments face a, a, really, a really tricky trade-off at, at the moment. On the one hand, you know, recessions cause breakdowns in relationships, relationships between workers and firms, relationships between firms themselves that are really, really, really difficult once they're broken to reestablish. So there's a clear case for policies to be put in place to prevent those relationships from being broken, um, particularly if you think that this is only you know, a persistent thing, but ultimately only temporary. On the other hand, I think it's very likely that the, the outcome of the virus will be some, some long-term structural shifts in the composition of activity. Some industries just aren't going to come back to, to where they were prior to the virus, and some industries are going to, going to benefit from the virus, they're going to expand in some way. And how you manage the trade-off between preventing existing relationships from breaking to allowing this needed structural change to occur, I think is a really difficult trade-off for governments to, to manage, but one that's going to be very important going forwards, um, and one that's going to be key to making sure that the effects of the virus on growth, even if persistent, aren't going to be too, too, too permanent. Warwick, um, you, you wanted to add something to that? You need to take off your microphone, turn your microphone on. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, Dan's exactly right. But I think what's really interesting here is we've seen a massive take up of technology during the adjustment phase over the last few months. So if you looked at two years, you, I would expect to see some fairly substantial increase in productivity in some sectors of the economy, just because this new technology is now being brought on board. The big mistake I think that was made after the global financial crisis was that central banks kept flushing the economy with funds and stopping dying industries from dying. And so the new industries which could have taken off didn't have the capacity to take off because the, the uh, zombie industries were holding those resources and the government kept subsidising, subsidising, and the central bank kept uh, giving liquidity. So I think the risk this time is if you try and keep too much liquidity in the system and stop firms from dying, you're going, to, you're going to destroy the capacity for a takeoff in productivity that might come from the technological um, takeoff. And so I think that's a real problem. And I don't think we've learned the lesson from the previous financial crisis. And I think we're, we're inevitably, both with fiscal policy measures and monetary policy measures, going to keep too many zombie firms going for too long. It's a very complex system to manage, but I think that's the real risk we face. Does anyone want to add anything? Any last? I hundred percent. Can I just add one thing? I hundred percent agree. And but I, sometimes that could be difficult also because uh, if that uh, industry is the main industry in the country, so like uh, in Norway, the oil and service industry, obviously we're still going to have it. But it is on the, it, it's planned to decline as we get towards the new climate change. But with the low oil price, that's obviously going to be very, very hard for that industry going forward. So there's a trade over how quickly you want to do that as well. But I, I totally agree with you that uh, you want you want firms you want firms to die and you want new firms to to, to, to grow as well. But uh, there's also trade off for how quickly you can do that, which makes it challenging when the main industry is the one you want to transition into a different uh, industry. Great. Um, there's just one one last question come in uh, from Jasmine Singh. She asks, it'll be interesting to see how much the government dedicates its fiscal stimulus to shovel ready projects versus stimulus that are aimed at greater structural change already accelerated by the pandemic, i.e. digitization of the economy. I guess that's more of a, a comment rather than a um, question. Um, if anyone would like to respond, but I'm happy for that as well. <laughs> 
Okay, um, I think we've come to that time um, where we can all give our panelists a hand of applause. So I know we won't be able to hear it, but it's really good karma if you do it at home anyway in, in these times. So thank you to all of our panelists. Um, so our next event is going to be on next week and we have uh, Benjamin Wong, Wong presenting his paper uh, with James. Um, it's going to be, it's, a, it's on now casting, now casting on GDP. Um, it'll be at 5 p.m. next Thursday, so we hope that you can join us uh, for that as well. So thank you all for, for your attendance.